Okay, in this video, we're going to start talking about fraction division. And so, um, similar to the beginning sections of chapter six, they, they do it two different ways. The first way they come at it is from the how many groups interpretation. So it says that with the how many groups interpretation, a division problem like eight divided by two means the number of groups we can make when we divide eight objects into two groups, into groups with two objects in each group. So we can make four groups in that situation. So this also works with fractions. And so if you say eight thirds divided by two thirds, this tells us the number of groups we can make when we divide eight thirds items into groups with two thirds items in each group. So that is the key, the key part of it, is that you're gonna have two thirds um, items in each group. You're looking for numbers of groups in that interpretation. I thought this table was a useful one because it demonstrates um, four different ways that you can interpret this and make it visible for your students. So the first is a table. This is a stripped strip diagram. Here is a double number line. So notice you have uh, one parallel line for each aspect of the problem. And then you can also annotate your equations. So there are many ways to present this. And so notice that you're taking it from whole numbers right here on the left um, into groups of fractions on the right. Okay, there are several approaches to dividing fractions. And here's one that you can divide fractions by giving them common denominators and then dividing the numerators. Okay, so what did they do here? Um, they had A over B, so let's say that that was um, 1 over 2, or we'll make it not 1, so let me just pick a different number. Let's make it, um, well, let's make it 1 over 2, uh, divided by, how about 3 over 4? So how would you do that? So let's look at that. I'm going to give you a second to look at it, and then I'll start, I'll continue doing it below. Okay, so I think I found a little typo in here, too. This should be a D right here. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, let's get the same denominator. So the denominator is going to be the product of B times D. So take your number or your fraction to the left and multiply it by D over D and take your fraction to the right and multiply that by B over B. So that's going to get us A times D divided by B times C. Okay, so you have that. So it says, notice the final expression, ADBC is the answer provided by the invert and multiply. So invert and multiply means this. It means we never really divide fractions. We multiply by the reciprocal, okay? And if we multiply by the reciprocal, we do indeed get the same expression, okay? So class activity, um, uh, on page CA113, so that's 6 um, goes through some of this, and we'll do this on the next page. I thought this is a good comparison uh, for the kids to understand this concept. So if you have six fifths, so here is one, two, three, four, five fifths. Here are the six fifths right here, and you put two fifths in, how many times can you put it in? Well, you can put it in three times. So notice what's happening. When the denominator is the same, um, six divided by two in the numerator is just like six divided by two without any denominators, okay? You have no fraction there. So think about it that way because that's an interesting way to view it. Okay, this is another way to present division. So if you have 6 over 20 and you divide it um, by 3 fourths, you can divide numerator by numerator and denominator by de denominator and get whole numbers. So that does indeed work. So let's try that a different way to make sure that it is working. Let's try it if we do it this way. Okay, so 4 can go into 25 times 
uh, three can go into six two times, and my final answer is two fifths. So yes, it checks. So that is a legitimate way to do it. There's also another strategy, and um, we're going to talk about that right here. Okay, so in, so in this um, procedure, what they're doing is this. They're saying, gosh, we would like to do this, but we can't because 3 does not go evenly into 5 and 4 does not go evenly, evenly into 7. So what can we do to this number so that it can be divided by 3 and 4 respectively? So what you can do is if you multiplied uh, the top by 3 and by 4, and the bottom by 3 and by 4, then that would work. So the reason why you're allowed to do this, do you see that this is just 12 over 12, which is equivalent to 1? And you can always multiply by 1. So look what happens when we do this. So what do we get if we say um, 5 times 3, which is 15, times 4, 15 times 4 is 60, and then I have 7 times 3, which is 21, and the denominator ends up being 84. So this is the new problem that you're really doing. Now, you can have a nice discussion about equivalent fractions. This fraction is equivalent to this fraction, but we're not having that discussion in this venue. Now, this is doing an awful lot of math to make this division possible. So I, I think um, you may want to do this a couple of times with the kids, but I think that the invert and multiply may be the easiest procedure um, to do. So let's look at 6.5, which is fraction division from the other point of view, from the how many units in one group perspective. Okay, so when we do the how many units in one group, when you do the 12 divided by 3, it means the number of objects in each group when we distribute 12 objects equally among three groups. So you have the number of objects, you have the number of groups, and so your answer is how many in each group. Okay, And I thought this table did a good job of uh, going through the different presentation models. So look at that a little bit closer at your leisure because you want to be able to express things in a couple of different ways. The table, the strip diagram, the double num number line, and the annotated equation. And again, to do the comparison between whole number division and fraction division so that students have a good handle on, on each of those. Okay, here is the most traditional way to handle multiplication, or division, excuse me, with fractions. So a lot of teachers describe it different ways, you know, flip the factor, keep it, change it, or flip it. Um, you want to let them know what they're actually doing and give them some good vocab. So what you're doing is you are multiplying, so you are changing the operation, the multiplication, and you are multiplying by the reciprocal of the fraction. Now, reciprocals are also multiplicative inverses, and that's because if you multiply the, the two fractions together, you would get a 1. So that's a good term to know as well, because that's going to help them uh, later on in one- and two-step uh, problems when they get to algebra and even pre-algebra. Okay, here uh, we're trying to use fractions to explain how many in one group interpretation of why invert and multiply is valid. So I thought this was a little bit interesting. So if you know that it takes half a can of paint to paint three-fifths of a wall, how many cans of paint can paint an entire wall? So what they did first off is they said, okay, the amount of paint for the full wall is going to be five times the amount in one part. So right here they said, okay, we can take a half a can and we can paint three-fifths of the wall. So I still have two more fifths that need painting. So how many, how, how do I do that? So they talk about it down here. Another way to summarize this reasoning is to observe that the whole wall 
Okay, so this whole wall here is five thirds of the part painted by half a can of paint. So the whole wall will take five thirds as much paint, which is one half times five thirds, and that equals five sixths. Now, doesn't that make sense in that it's not going to take two cans, uh, it's not going to take a whole can rather to paint that whole wall. It's going to take a little bit less, and five six makes intuitive sense. So what they're doing is they are tying it into the keep it, change it, flip it, um, invert and multiply procedure. So look at that. It's kind of interesting. You have to kind of wrap your head around the reasoning of it. Now this table gives another way to approach the exact same problem. So this is what we did. So this piece right here is what we did uh, on the previous page. But this little piece right here is doing it a little bit more incrementally. So read both of those and see which one works best for you. Okay, so this is a very important little section. So the wording of story problems. If you are dividing by half, that's different than saying you're dividing in half. So dividing by half, dividing five by half, five divided by one half, this answers the question, how many halves are in five? And we get the answer that there are 10 halves in five. Okay, which is very different than dividing in half. So if you divide five into two parts, that's five divided by two, which is a totally different number than 10. So this wording is very, very important. So dividing by a half and dividing in a half are two different things. Dividing in a half is actually dividing by two. Okay, so be able to really distinguish the wording uh, to know what you are dividing by. Okay, this table right here, going through the basic algorithm for dividing decimals is very important. So spend some time looking at this, remembering back to grade school how you divided and how you had to move the decimal and then bring it up. Okay, because this is going to be something that if you're teaching, you know, fifth, I guess maybe third, fourth, fifth, somewhere in there, uh, you'll have to go over this algorithm. Then they talk, they continue talking about their decimal piece, um, well, their fraction piece, by saying uh, two interpretations of divisions for decimals. One is how many groups. With this interpretation, 35 divided by 7, for example, means the number of groups that can be made if we divide 35 objects into groups with 7 in each group. So versus how many in one group. With this interpretation, 35 divided by 7 means the number um, in each group if we divide 35 evenly into 7 groups. So then they go into explaining the shifting of decimal points by multiplying and dividing by the same power of 10. So one way to explain the shifting of decimal points in a division problem is to say the following. When we shift the decimal points in both the divisor and the dividend, the same number of places we have multiplied and divided by the same power of 10. Thus, we are replacing the original problem with an equivalent problem that can be solved by previous methods. The key point is to move the decimal points in both the divisor and the dividend. If you don't do that, then you're not having an equivalent problem. So if you think about this in terms of um, a division problem like this. So let's say we had 10 divided by 2. Okay, what if we move the decimal point in the top and in the bottom to the right by one place? Okay, do you see how you're getting equivalent? And you can go the other way with it as well. So what if you moved it the other way and you had 1 divided by 0.2? Okay, that would also be equivalent. 
So that's what you want to be showing your kids. And there's a, a nice little graphic over here as well. Another very good way to explain the shifting of decimal points when you do division is to think of it in terms of dollars and cents. And if you're talking about how many pounds of plums you can buy with $4.50 if the price is one twenty-seven per pound, you can easily turn that into pennies, okay, on both ends, and that would make sense to the students. You can also visually do that with actual money to explain that shifting. Okay, a second way to do it is uh, to talk about changing the unit. And this diagram below, this figure, shows you a little bit more about that. So here is your division problem. Here are your 29 hundredths. And here is your one whole and seven tenths. So you can think about uh, breaking this up and you can actually pull the, pull this model physically apart with your students to figure out that answer. Okay, this little piece about reasonableness, um, it seems like it's just an offhanded comment, but I'll tell you, um, the higher you get in math, you always want to ask yourself, is that a reasonable answer? Because that will, that will absolutely help you catch uh, mistakes here and there. We also talk on this next page about dividing numbers in the billions, uh, millions, and trillions. And it's all about, you know, moving the decimal place and having this large number terminology tied in, tied with place value. So you can see over here, they give you a nice chart, and you can see the patterns that develop. So this is important for kids to have a sense of how numbers are consistently created throughout the place value chart. Now I just added this in because it's not in our course but it does come up a lot so I thought I would just explain this to you. If you have numbers that are written in scientific notation, okay, so these would be examples of scientific notation numbers. Um, to, in order to multiply them, you would multiply the same types, okay, these whole numbers, they get multiplied first that gives you the 15. Then you're going to use exponent rules. Here's a base raised to the second power. Here's a base raised to the fourth power. You write the base once and you add the exponents. And that's how they got 15 times 10 to the six. Now, one little problem. Scientific notation, by definition, only has, um, it's, o it's only in the ones this whole number is only in the ones, so we'll have to change that up. So if you ended up with 15 times 10 to the sixth, your decimal point is there. You should not, by definition, have a number greater than one um, in this multiplying position. So you're going to change that to 1.5, and that's going to increase your exponent to 7 when you do that. So that's just a topic that I wanted you to understand. Okay, they do a second one here. So if you have a division problem, you're going to divide the whole numbers. You get a 5, and then you're going to write the base once, and for division, you subtract the exponents. Okay, and this is in the correct form. I don't need to move any decimals. So then on the other pages of your uh, note packet, I give you some things that you could use in your um, notebook that you're creating. Here is a nice little bingo card set, and you can use that to identify fractions with, with your kids. Here is um, other worksheets, fraction, division, collision. It's a little problem set. And um, here's another one. So they're all back here for you to use. I also have uh, worksheets here that you can find. So there are a lot of worksheets that are out there that are already pre-made for you, that are colorful, and I encourage you to use them.